Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's so nice to see so many of you here uh, this lunchtime for today's talk. Uh, my name is Francesca. I'm the associate curator for paintings made between 1600 and 1800 here at the gallery. So this is uh, one of the paintings that I help look after. It's one of my favorite paintings in the collection, and I'm thrilled to be talking about it to you all today. You are, you are very numerous today. There's a lot of people, which is lovely, but if at any point you're standing at the back and you can't hear me, or sitting at the front and can't hear me, do, do a wave, and I'll, I'll do my best to, to shout a little bit louder. When I was thinking about preparing today's lunchtime talk, it occurred to me that I think sometimes uh, we get into a rhythm here at the gallery where we start our talks with facts. So it's quite easy to stand up in front of a painting and say, well, this is the artist, this is the subject, it's a painting of this, it's made in this date, and, and kind of bombard you with information from the get-go uh, about the, 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 that kind of facts and figures type of history. And actually for this painting, which you'll notice I've not named yet, um, I wanted to start with questions rather than with answers, because I think this is undoubtedly one of the most enigmatic, one of the most provocative, one of the most mysterious paintings in our collection here at the National Gallery. And so I think it, it, it bears asking these questions. Um, what is this a painting of? What are we looking at? Who is this? What is it that we are meant to think or feel when we're standing, or in, in your case, sitting, in front of this painting? And I don't think there are fixed answers to these questions, but I thought in beginning to get us really looking at the picture, I might just talk you through what it is that I see when I come and stand in front of this painting. So the first thing I notice when I come and stand in this gallery and look at this picture is that I'm looking at a woman lying on some kind of couch or some kind of bed. And actually, for me, when I come and look at this painting, the bit of it that always catches my eye, the bit that my eye is always drawn to, is just here, this area where you have the silhouette of the hip against that very, very bright white bedsheet. You've got the whiteness of the sheet, you've got the highlight of the light hitting that hip. And for me, that really always draws my eye. It's right in the center of the painting. That's what I see first. And when I look at that, I'm reminded of two really important things. One, that this is a painting of a naked woman. And two, that I'm looking at this woman from behind, which is pretty unusual, because even if we think about um, erotic images today, normally we're looking at something that's a bit more explicit, a bit more front on, a, a bit more um, generally people are facing us if we're looking at that kind of painting. So I think those are two really crucial things. Having looked at this central area where we get this amazing silhouette of the hip against the white fabric, my eye tends to be drawn down towards the woman's legs and then back up along her spine. And I think this is a painting that really is, in many ways, a kind of exercise in curves. And that's what my eye always seems to pick out, following the kind of undulating rhythms of this body, this curve, this very sinuous curve of the spine. And when I follow that line, what strikes me again is this idea that I'm looking at this woman from behind. So in some ways, what I'm being seduced by is not necessarily what I'm looking at, but it's what, what I'm imagining. I think that's really key for this picture, that we're not, we're not looking at this woman front on, we're not seeing her breasts, it's not, it's not sort of explicit and confrontational like that. But there's the imagination playing, because I don't think you can really look at this back without imagining the view from the other side. And that, to me, is really explicit when I get up to the woman's face. Because if you look very closely at this face here, you'll see that on her cheek, there's just the tiniest little bit of a red highlight, as if she's blushing. And to me, that always feels like such an invitation to, to kind of imagine her face, imagine that she's going to turn to us, imagine what she looks like from the front. And of course, the beauty of this painting, this incredibly modern, incredibly exciting conceit, is that we do get to see this woman from the front, because by the time my eyes come here and gone down her body and then back up her spine to her face, I'm caught by the mirror that we see opposite and the fact that we do see this woman looking back at us. We get to come face to face with her. And I think for me, there's always a moment there which is both kind of resolution and dissolution, because on the one hand, I remember, I think, yes, we actually get to see her face. We get to have her looking back at us. 
But look closely at that. How, how much detail can you make out in that face that's reflected at us in the mirror? It's actually very blurry. It's very ambiguous. So it, just at the moment when you catch sight of it and you think, oh, I'm going, to, I'm going to see what this woman looks like. I'm going to see her looking at me. She sort of dissolves away again. You see and you don't see. And I think this theme of ambiguity is really key in this painting. And then I look at all the other details, because by the time my eyes got to the mirror, I remember, oh yes, there's this amazing red drapery that falls over that half of the painting, and there's you know, a gray bed sheet as well as the, the white bed sheets, and, and that's a mirror, and those are sort of pink ribbons, which must have been what was holding it up on the wall. It's just been plucked off the wall, and it's being held up by this little boy. And it's really not until my eye gets right to this top corner of the painting, just about as far over as I could be, that I noticed that, of course, this isn't a little boy. He's got wings, and little boys don't have wings. They don't normally have feathers sprouting out of their backs, normally. Um, and so, of course, this isn't just a little boy. This is Cupid, the god of love. And it's really having kind of been on this amazing journey, looking around at the canvas, looking around at everything that's going on. It's only at that last moment that I remember, oh, hang on, we're not in the real world here. We're in the mythological world. And this isn't a woman, and that's not a little boy. That's Cupid. And this is Venus, the goddess of love. And if it weren't for those wings, I think you really could spend a lot of time looking at that picture and not notice that. So having not told you the artist and the title, I will now. This is, of course, the Roque B. Venus by Diego Velasquez, who is, I think, undoubtedly the greatest painter of 17th century Spain. It is the only surviving nude to have been painted by Velasquez's hands, so it's very, very special. It's also a very mysterious painting. We don't know exactly when it was painted. We don't know exactly where. We don't know who it was painted for. So it's a painting that has a lot of questions uh, that surround it. But it's been here at the National Gallery since 1906, and it has in that time become one of our most iconic pictures. I think uh, this is certainly the most famous nude in the gallery's collection. I think you could argue this is probably the most famous nude in Britain. So it's a picture that um, delights people, surprises people, but one that has, as I've said, many questions still around it. And so that's kind of what I wanted this talk to be today, a chance to really look closely at this painting, to focus on it, and also get a bit of that sort of history and context around it. So with that in mind, I thought I should start with a little bit of um, biography about Velázquez himself. He is born in 1599 in the city of Seville. He starts training when he's very young, just uh, 11, so in 1610, with the leading artist in Seville at that time, who's called Francisco Pacheco. And Pacheco is really important for Velázquez because he doesn't just train with Pacheco, he's actually going to go on to marry Pacheco's daughter. So there's very close links between the families. And so he has this early training with Pacheco. And then in 1617, when he's 18 years old, he sets up as an independent master. So at that point, he's got his own studio. He's painting his own pictures. And we're really lucky here at the gallery. We have an outstanding collection of pictures by Velázquez. So after the talk, if you were just to pop over there, you could see two very early paintings of the Immaculate Conception and St. John the Evangelist, painted during these early years uh, of Velázquez in Seville. Both of those date to about 1618. And if you do go and look at them, you'll see they're, they're very typical insofar as their religious compositions, they're, they're very naturalistic, the figures look very realistic, um, they have quite an earthy palette to them, and they have a very kind of strongly contrasted use of light and dark, which we think Velázquez may have picked up um, from Caravaggio, maybe hearing about what it was that Caravaggio was doing with light at the beginning of the 17th century. But Velázquez doesn't stay in Seville, and he doesn't stay uh, producing these religious and still life paintings of his early years, because in 1622, he goes for the first time to Madrid. And he goes to the court in Madrid with letters of introduction. And clearly, he has some kind of impact, because in 1623, the following year, he's invited back to Madrid by the Count Duke Olivares, who's very, very important, very high up at court. And in that year, on the 30th of August, we know that he paints his first picture of the king, King Philip IV. And we know that he paints that first picture on the 30th of August, and we know that on the 6th of October, so just over a month later, he's appointed painter to the king. So he's clearly had a huge impact. He's still a very young man. And this changes his life, because the rest of his life is going to be spent almost exclusively in Madrid, 
almost exclusively painting for the king. And these portraits are amazing. We're very lucky to have two pictures here of uh, Philip IV. And you can really look through Velazquez's portraits of the royal family and see them aging in paint with all these years that he spends with them. But it's Madrid that I want to think about because other than two visits to Italy, one in about 1630 to 31, where Velazquez is sort of being sent nominally to learn about Italian painting, and another between 1649 and 1651, where in theory he's going to buy things for the king. Other than these two visits to Italy, Velazquez spends all the rest of his life in Madrid. And I think Madrid holds a lot of secrets and, 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 and ideas that are very important for looking at the rope B Venus because Madrid in the 17th century has this amazing paradox. On the one hand, it's home to the royal collection of painting. This is a collection of some of the finest pictures in the world. And it includes, interestingly for us, some of the finest nudes in the world. So paintings, mythological paintings by Rubens and Titian. And these are all in the king's collection. The king has, has these in his palaces. And yet at the same time, it is in Madrid in the 17th century absolutely forbidden to own or paint a nude. So there's this weird paradox, right? Um, the background to that being, of course, that in 17th century Spain, uh, the Catholic Church is incredibly powerful, there's the Inquisition, there's a lot of su suspicion around the idea of painting a nude woman, because who is that for? And who's looking at it? And how can you make sure they're not thinking naughty thoughts while they're looking at it? And how can you have any sense of, of what that painting might go on to mean or to influence? Um, and we know that there are, there are explicit documents forbidding both the importation of nudes painted abroad and for it, like forbidding artists themselves to paint them. So there's an Indice Expurgatorio of 1640, which says that if artists paint nude figures, specifically nude women, they will be excommunicated and exiled from Spain. So there's this extraordinary contradiction that on the one hand, the nude at this time in Spain is the highest achievement of art. It's the absolute height of what any artist can do. The king and his courtiers own lots and lots of nude paintings, and yet it's totally forbidden and illegal. So there's always one rule for one, people, one set of people and one for another, that's familiar. But um, there is this kind of particular circumstance that's very unusual around uh, the painting of a nude. And that's probably why this is the only surviving nude by Velázquez, because they really weren't painting many of them in 17th century Spain. This is, I think, a very innovative composition. I think there's lots of elements of this that I'll go into in a minute that make it feel very, very modern. But inevitably, any artist is always influenced by what he's seen and what's come before. And I think to really understand what it is that's so innovative about the Rope B Venus, you have to think of the two kind of precedents, if you will, the two types of Venus painting that were most popular at this point. So thinking of people like Rubens and Titian. Artists like them had really painted Venus, generally speaking, in two modes. The first was the reclining Venus. So even if um, you, you haven't seen one, you could maybe imagine a Venus lying on a bed in a kind of rich palatial room. Maybe you can see gardens outside. Maybe the room is very elaborate, very rich, telling you that she's in some sort of imaginary palace. And you can imagine a woman lying naked on a bed, but facing you. So it's quite, as I said, kind of confrontational, quite open about the fact that she's the most beautiful woman in the world. She is the goddess of love. And in effect, she's sort of on offer in the painting. The second type of painting of Venus is sort of known as Venus at her toilette. Venus um, being adorned with jewels and with clothes. She's maybe not looking at us, but she might be looking in a mirror. She's generally surrounded by attendants or graces or cupids. And in those kind of paintings, it's the richness that reminds us that she's the goddess of love because she's got these wonderful pearls and diamonds and rubies and gold threaded fabrics and furs everywhere. There's a sumptuousness to that kind of image. So if you're to look at this painting, bearing those two ideas in mind, it becomes apparent, I think, quite quickly how different what Velázquez is doing is. Because look at this painting. There's no jewellery. There's no finery. There's no sort of riches on show. There's no gold, no, no kind of bangles or jewels or earrings or anything like that. It's actually, if you look at it closely, a fairly sort of modest looking space, because look at this expanse of bare wall that we see at the back there behind Venus's head. It doesn't look particularly like a palace. It doesn't tell us that it's a kind of rich, sumptuous interior. 
In fact, if anything, that looks like a very kind of ordinary contemporary room, maybe a contemporary artist's studio. And that, I think, raises an interesting possibility because then if this is just an ordinary contemporary room, could this be just an ordinary contemporary woman? And that's something I think that really has plagued the picture, not plagued the picture, but been associated with this painting right from the very beginning. Because the first reference we have to this painting is in 1651. And when we have this reference in the archives in, in 1651, it doesn't call it a Venus. The archives describe a painting of a nude woman. So already there's that ambiguity tied up in the painting from its very, the very first reference to it. Is it a goddess or is it a human being, an ordinary woman? And that, I think, is something that you can really, really get a sense of if you come and look at the painting closely. Obviously, it's a little bit difficult uh, in a talk, but do come and look closely afterwards, because I think this ambiguity, this question about whether she's a goddess or whether she's a human, is absolutely tied into the very essence of the painting. It's something that Velázquez is, is asking, even in his brushwork. So if you look at certain areas of this painting, the brushwork is incredibly loose, incredibly free. I'm thinking in particular of these ribbons here, which are just, if you look closely, you can see they're just kind of dashed off, or particularly where Cupid's leg meets that bit of fabric there. There's these very loose, thick lines of black paint. You get the impression it's been done quickly. You can see the brush strokes. It's, it, there's a kind of um, a freedom to it and, and a visible mark making that you get there. But if you were to look at Venus's body, you can't see any brush strokes. I mean, you can spend as long as, I, I've spent a long time looking at that. I can't see any sign of how it's been painted. Instead, what we get is this incredibly crisp, incredibly focused body, this kind of luminous skin, almost pearlescent, but you can't really see how it's been painted. And I think part of what that gives us is an effect almost like photography. It's almost like Velázquez is focusing our attention for us on the body of Venus, and everything else is a bit, is a bit softer, is a bit blurrier. Um, and that, I think, is really true when you look in the mirror, because if you compare the kind of crispness of the outline of that hip there, and then this blurry, indistinct face in the mirror, I don't think that's just that Velázquez couldn't paint a really crisply defined face. We know he can, he's, he's the most extraordinary artist. So he's making a deliberate choice. He's deliberately leaving that to be blurry. And I, I wanted to read you a quote. It's probably my favorite quote about this painting by um, an art historian called Enriqueta Harris. And she says, there is an ambivalence about this woman, an uncertainty as to whether she is a human being or the goddess of myth. And we are all left, each one of us, to fill in the features of that face in the mirror. And that, to me, is what is so fascinating about this painting, that to paint the goddess of love, to paint Venus, is in a way to paint ideal beauty. And what actually is ideal beauty? It's different for me than it is for you. Than for you, everyone has their own version of what the most beautiful woman in the world looks like. And so here, I think we're really being invited with this blurry reflection to make her exactly who we want her to be in our own imaginations. It's a very, very uh, clever conceit. So as I said, the first reference we have to this painting comes in uh, November 1651. And we don't really know when the painting was produced, though it was clearly before that. We date the painting to between about 1647 and 1651, which is effectively to say either just before just during or just after Velázquez's second trip to Italy. And we, we, we've arrived at that by looking very closely at how the picture's painted and looking at other examples of works that are dated that can help us kind of pinpoint that. But that raises a lot of questions because that means, is it, is it a painting of a nude that he paints in Italy where there aren't the same restrictions on representing naked women? Or is it a picture that he paints as soon as he comes back with all those Italian nudes that he's seen still fresh in his mind? Some people have questioned, is this an Italian woman who he's fallen in love with on this second trip, which takes place between 1649 and 1651? And the answer is that we don't know. But what is unusual is that when we have this inventory of the painting in November uh, 1651, you might expect that given that Velázquez is the king's painter, this painting would turn up in a royal inventory because he's the king's painter, effectively the king has kind of first dibs on anything that he produces. 
but that's not where the painting appears. It actually appears in the inventory of a very, very, very minor painter and picture dealer in Madrid called Domingo Guerra Coronel. And we do not know how a painting that, like this, a masterpiece like this by the most important painter in the country, ends up in this very, very minor collection. We simply have no idea. We know, however, where it goes from that point onwards. So the reason it appears in the inventory in 1651 is that Domingo Guerra Coronel has just died, and it's a posthumous inventory. And we know that the painting is then acquired by Don Gaspar de Haro, who is uh, not only a notorious collector of paintings, but also a notorious libertine. So if you read books about this picture, there's always a line that says he loved pictures as much as he loved women. So maybe that's why this kind of painting would have appealed to him. The picture then descends in his family. It descends through the family of the Dukes and Duchesses of Alba until the very end of the 18th century, where the Duchess of Alba gives the painting to her former lover, the then Prime Minister, Don Manuel Godoy. And we know that he hangs it in a room that's described as being a room full of Venuses. But we know that Goya's naked Macha, who is definitely not a Venus and is very, very explicitly naked, was also hanging in there. So, again, a, a painting that's hanging in a room for kind of very, very private consumption. And it stays in Godoy's collection until 1808. 1808, of course, is when the French have invaded Spain. It's during the Napoleonic Wars. And many of the great collections, including parts of the royal collection, are sequestered. And there are lots of kind of dealers and agents in Spain at that point buying pictures for other people. So the painting is then bought for a British dealer called William Buchanan, and it takes a few years, but by 1813, the painting has arrived in England. And then in 1814, Buchanan sells the painting for 500 pounds, which sounds very reasonable today, but it was, it was a big amount of money, um, to a man called John Bacon Sorry Morritt. And John Bacon Sorry Morritt lives in a house in the North Riding of Yorkshire called Rokeby Park. And so that finally is how we arrive at knowing this painting as the Rokeby Venus, because it hung for almost a century after that point in Rokeby Park. And there's wonderful kind of letters and titbits from how, how the painting was appreciated there. So in 1820, John Bacon Sorry Morritt writes a letter saying he's been rearranging his pictures, quote, to make room for my painting of Venus's backside. Charming. <laughs> Um, he, he decides eventually that he's going to hang this on the chimney piece, so sort of above the fireplace. And he says he arrived at that decision so that, quote, ladies may avert their downcast eyes and connoisseurs may steal a glance without drawing the said posterior into the company. So um, I suppose he thought that was a place where he could have uh, the painting on view, but it wasn't going to be totally disruptive to polite society and conversation. And in fact, if you go to visit Rokeby Park today, you can see a replica of the painting hanging uh, still there above the chimney piece. And it's a replica, of course, because we have the original here. And we have the original here because in 1905, the family decided that they needed to sell the painting. They sold it to one of the leading uh, London dealerships at the time, Thomas Agnews and Son. Um, and Thomas Agnews and Son were then asking £40,000 for the painting. I know that doesn't necessarily to us sound like a lot of money, but for a bit of context, 20 years later, when Van Gogh's Sunflowers, probably one of our most famous pictures, was acquired, we paid £1,000 for it. So £1,000, £40,000. And that's with, you know, 20 years of inflation. Um, at the time, the National Gallery's annual purchasing budget was just £5,000 a year. So £40,000 is a huge amount of money. But very luckily for us, in 1903, so just a few years before, the National Art Collections Fund had been set up. National Art Collections Fund maybe doesn't sound that familiar, but you probably have heard of the Art Fund, who still help us buy paintings today. And um, having been set up in 1903, when this came around in 1905, this was their first kind of major chance, the first chance to really save a painting for a nation, to have a big public appeal, to ask people to send in money. Um, and they did. They successfully raised the £40,000. We know that it came out afterwards that the king himself had donated anonymously £8,000. And there was a huge kind of press furore around this, this picture. This was the nation's Venus, and it was impacted that it could be kept in Britain for people to enjoy. And so it was presented from the National Art Collections Fund to the National Gallery in 1906. 
And I think that very high profile nature of the painting, how hard everybody had worked to, um, to acquire it for the nation, to save it from being exported abroad into a private collection where we'd never see it again, really made what happened a few years later all the more shocking. Because as, as some of you will know, this is a picture that was actually attacked by a suffragette in 1914, a suffragette named Mary Richardson. And this is something that historically the National Gallery hasn't you know, liked to talk about too much because actually we're here to tell you the story of the, how the painting was made and to think about how beautiful it is and, and to explore what it might mean. And really this is just a little bit of its history. But in this centenary year of some women being allowed to vote and with the statue of Millicent Fawcett going up in Parliament Square yesterday, it felt very important to mention it to you. Not least because I think it actually teaches us an important lesson about the painting, which is that actually the Rote B Venus is always more complicated than we think it is. So later feminist re-readings looked at Mary Richardson's attack and said, well, this is because it's a naked woman and, and men are objectifying her and people are coming to stare at this naked body. And in fact, if you go back and you look at what Mary Richardson actually says in her trial and in the newspapers at the time, she was doing that because it was a high profile painting and specifically because she wanted to get Mrs. Pankhurst out of Holloway prison where she was being really uh, very poorly treated. So that, that was her motivation. This kind of feminist rereading about the male gaze and objectifying women came in later and actually later for Mary Richardson meant after she'd been a socialist in the 1920s and then a fascist um, organizing for Sir Oswald Mosley's black shirts in the 1930s. So the story is always more complicated was basically what I wanted to, to share with you about that. But happily, you know, restored, this um, has been, you know, since, since it arrived at the gallery, one of our most popular paintings, certainly one of the most enticing, beguiling, mysterious. And it's really up to you, I think, to decide what that gaze means, whether when you walk past, you feel like you're being caught out, which I have to say is always what I feel, that Venus has caught me looking at her and now she's looking at me, looking at her. Or maybe you feel it's an invitation. Maybe she's you know, looking at you with come hither eyes. Or maybe she's questioning who you are and what you're doing. And to me, that I think actually is, is the ultimate beauty of this picture and, and of most great works of art. I think they're the ones that uh, ask more questions than they can answer. So I hope you'll agree with me. And do please come and have a look closely at the painting afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you.